Turn in your Bible to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. When John Wesley, the famous uh, preacher from the 1700s, would go around preaching, and he was preaching in England for the most part, and he would travel. He was a traveling preacher, he was a, a circuit riding preacher, and he had a, a portable pulpit. He would carry it with him, and it was a, a large pulpit. I mean, it stand on this high, and it unfolded, and it had steps that went up in it so he could stand and preach. Uh, as a matter of fact, Beverly and I saw it once in a, a museum in North Carolina. Uh, but he would travel and became a very prominent preacher in England. He would go out and he would set up his pulpit in a pasture somewhere or field somewhere, and people would just flock to hear him preach. And as a result of that, young men would come to him and they would ask John Wesley to train them in preaching. Now he would give them some instruction and then eventually he would give them what he called his probationary message to preach. They would go out and they would preach somewhere. And then they would come back to him and he would ask them two questions. Every time they came back, he asked the same two questions. He said, was anyone converted or did anyone get mad? And if they answered no to both of those questions, then John Wesley would say, I'm sorry, but I don't feel like you've been called to preach. You need to go home. And he would no longer train them. Now what John Wesley was saying there was he understood the power of the Word of God. And when the power of the Word of God is preached to a sinner, it will do one of two things. It will either convict them of their sin and force them to convert to Christianity and become a believer, or they won't like what they hear, and they'll get angry. He was saying that the Holy Spirit working through a preacher has that kind of power when the preacher uses the words of God. You see, he, he understood the power of words. And this morning we're going to talk, talk about the tongue, we're going to talk about words. James, the brother of Jesus, had a lot to say in the scripture about our tongues, about how we talk. So this morning we're going to begin here in James in chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that they will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who is also able to control his whole body. Now when we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we also guide a whole animal. And consider ships. Though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how large a forest a small fire ignites, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue, of the, uh, the tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among the parts of the body. It pollutes the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is set on fire by hell. Every sea creature, reptile, bird, or animal is tamed and has been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. We praise our Lord and Father with it, and we curse men who are made in God's likeness with it. Praising and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives? My brothers, or a grapevine produce figs. Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh fruit, a fresh water. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to take charge of this service. Lord, we ask you to uh, take control of my tongue. Lord, let me speak only the truth of your wisdom, the truth of your word. Lord, we believe that God is in all things this morning, and let us be obedient to you in all things. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In this third chapter of the book of James, the brother of Jesus uh, presents us with the matter of the tongue, and he presents it as being a test of our living faith. Because true faith is demonstrated by the way that we speak. You see, the tongue can let a person know whether or not the faith that we proclaim to have is false or if it's real. Oh. Nothing reveals what's inside a person's heart more than what comes out of their mouth. 
Now this whole book of James revolves around this concept, this spiritual fact, that when we are truly saved, when we have true believing faith in Jesus Christ, there is a change in how we live. We become born again, we, we become a new creature in Christ, we become a new person, and with all that newness also comes a new mouth, a new oh. way of speaking. The tongue, the speech that we use will tell what's inside of our heart. James is saying here that living out our faith means that we're controlling our tongues. Anybody in here ever have any problem controlling your mouth? Any of you ever, any ever have let me out? It hadn't been long ago we were watching one of those old Andy Griffith episodes that Phil loves so much where Andy was talking about those greasy words that just slip out. Have you ever had any of those greasy words that slip out and you just wish you could snatch them back? But it's too late. Uh, have any of you ever been guilty of maybe using a profane word? You stump your toe or slam your finger in something and it slips out and you don't mean for it to? Uh, has there ever been a time in your life, maybe when you were in a situation where you felt like you should have spoke up and you didn't? Psalms chapter 64 verse 34 speaks of people who aim bitter words like arrows. They ain't been a word like arrows. Why does the scripture speak of a word as being like an arrow? Because arrows can kill from a distance. And just like an arrow kills from a distance, a word spoken out of turn can cause destruction. It can kill from a distance. Especially in this age of technology, we can, we can take a word real fast and we can send it all the way across the world. We can send it to the other side of the world. And those words have so much power, they have a killing effect. So our words can be like a deadly arrow. James in chapter 2 and verse 26 said, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now that's a pretty well-known scripture for most Christians. Most of us have heard this scripture over and over again, that faith without works is dead. That same, that same uh, scripture falls with our words. You see, our words are part of our works. So we know that if we're speaking the truth of the word of God, if we're speaking in a clean tongue, then, then we know that uh, you, what I'm saying is that you can't speak a good word unless the spirit is living in you. You can't speak a good word unless the, the spirit is living in you. A person of false faith will speak deadly words. A person of real faith will speak living words. Oh. Now, each one of us this morning is carrying around a concealed weapon. And there's a lot of stuff going on on the news these days about gun control and, and, and all of that. And I'm not getting into that this morning about whether or not we can carry weapons and have a concealed weapon permit and all of that stuff. But every one of us this morning has a concealed weapon. And all we have to do to use it is open our mouth. Now, don't shoot the messenger this morning, but uh, again, maybe the football coach is coming out in me again a little bit. I like statistics, all right? When I was a coach, I liked to look at the stats. I like to look at how many first downs we picked up in the game and how many conversions we missed and all of that stuff. But when I started studying the business of the tongue, I went and I looked up some statistics. And guys, men, Statistically, we talk too much. All right. Statistically, the average man says in one day 18,000 words. That's statistically now the average man. I know a guy like Randy makes up some of us because I don't hear a lot come out of Randy. But uh, I'm making up what he's, you know, I'm doubling it. So we average out 18,000. All right. But, you know, uh, that, that's a, a, a statistic. Now, ladies, Statistically, women speak 30,000 words a day. 30,000 words a day. Now, in the women's defense, in the women's defense, I will say that I do believe that a lot of that is because when they're speaking to a man, they have to say everything twice because we don't listen the first time. Amen. If you took all of the words that the average person spoke, in one year and wrote them down, what you would end up with would be a stack of 66 books, all containing at least 800 pages each. We talk a lot. 
And in this day and age, not only do we have to add our speech to that, but also the words we type, because with the technology, we're sending out a lot of words that may not be spoken with the tongue, but when we type our little messages into our text and our Facebook and our emails, that's the same thing as speaking. So we have to be aware of the fact that we talk a lot in this day and age with our fingers as well as our tongue. You remember when you were a kid? Now, this may go for some of us that are a little older. I don't know if that's going to go with you guys or not. But, you know, when you go into a doctor's office, one of the first things the doctor would do when I was a kid, and I'm not sure they do this as much as they used to, is they'd say, stick out your tongue. If you weren't feeling well, they'd say, stick out your tongue. And they'd take that stick and they'd look down the throat. And they could tell a lot, or they thought they could tell a lot at that time by looking down your throat at your tongue. They could tell a lot about your physical health. And James here is telling us that by examining our tongues, we can kind of get a measure, we can get a, a, a little bit of an idea about our spiritual health. You see, the tongue's been getting people in trouble for a long time. A long time. All the way back in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve were in the garden, we all know the story, everything is perfect, it is wonderful, there's no sin, there's no sickness, there's no death. They don't have to worry about anything. Everything is just as perfect as it could possibly be. And, and then Satan comes into the garden as a snake and he, he tempts Eve. And Eve takes a, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and she gives some to Adam and everything starts falling apart. And they look at each other and they figure out they're both naked and they go hide in the bushes somewhere. And she, uh, God comes walking into the garden comes walking in the garden looking for him and he's calling them out. They come out and he asks, why are you hiding? And they say, because we're naked. And then in Genesis in chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, this short conversation goes on. God says, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And then man replied. Adam would have been a whole lot better off if he just kept his mouth shut. But Adam went and opened his big mouth. And he said, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave to me with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. The first sin just took place and the first thing Adam did after that sin was start making excuses. First he blamed God for it, for giving him the woman. Then he blamed the woman for giving him the fruit. And ever since that time, our mouths and our sin have been connected together. Often our mouths will lead us into sin. When Paul was speaking about sinners, describing them in Romans in chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14, he said, their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues, vipers, venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. When God went to Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, and he gave him a vision of a prophecy that he wanted him to deliver to the nation of Judah and to Israel, when the vision was over and Isaiah came to himself in Isaiah 6 and chapter 5, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am a ruined man because I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. Nothing marks a man or a woman's sinfulness more than a dirty mouth. We can hear it coming out of them. Mark chapter 7 verse 20. Mark chapter 7 verse 20 says, Then he said, this is Jesus speaking, What comes out of a person, that defiles him. So Jesus is telling us it's not what we take into our bodies that defiles us so much as it is the things that come out of our mouth. What comes out of us defiles us. Controlling our tongue, controlling our tongue is necessary. James is telling us that a righteous heart cannot produce unrighteous words and an unrighteous heart cannot produce righteous words. Now we're going to go through this again, this whole uh, first part of chapter 3. We're going to do it a couple of verses at a time. We're going to dig a little bit deeper. So let's look at verses 1 and 2 again. Again, we're in James 3 now, verses 1 and 2. The Word says, and I just read it a moment ago, Not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who is also able to control his whole body. Now James starts out by addressing this business of speech and tongues of teachers. 
He's talking to everyone here who is a pastor teacher or anyone who's in a formal teaching role within the church, Sunday school teachers, anyone who's teaching a Bible study. He's talking about the formal teachers within the church. And he's saying to these teachers that unless you are a person who is able to control your mouth, you need to leave teaching to someone else. And he's saying that because he's saying you, teachers, are held to a stricter judgment than other people because you're teaching the Word of God in such an important position that you have to be able to control your mouth. You have to be able to control your mouth if you're going to teach the Word of God. In James in chapter 1 and verse 26, James said, if anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, then his religion is useless, and he declares that he deceives himself. So we apply that to what he just said about teachers. If a teacher cannot control their tongue, then that teacher is deceiving himself. He's deceiving himself. Now, the teacher's deceiving himself if his religion is false, and that's what James just said can't control your tongue, your religion is false and you're deceiving yourself. If they're standing in front of a classroom teaching, then they are also deceiving their students. So for that very reason, James tells us unless a teacher can control their mouth, they need to leave the teaching to someone else and stay out of it and, until they learn that maturity. He says you become mature. As you become more mature, you learn to uh, you learn to control your tongue better and then you can evolve into that teaching position. In verses 3 and 4, in verses 3 and 4, he says, Now, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we also guide the whole animal and consider ships. Though very large and uh, very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. James is telling us here the tongue has a great deal of power. Now you think about horses. They used to fool with a few horses back when we were farming. We had a lot of cattle and we'd get them up on the horses and some of them were stubborn. But you'd, uh, you'd put that bit in the horse's mouth and generally you could control the whole body of the animal by, by pulling on the reins and, and, and directing that horse. I had one, it didn't matter which way you turned her head, she'd go which way, way she wanted to anyway. Uh, but but you, could, you could turn a horse, you should be able to turn a horse with a bit in her mouth. That's a large animal that you're controlling with just, just from the mouth and the ships. Think about these ships. We have huge, man, think about a military ship, uh, uh, an aircraft carrier. It has a little bitty rudder on the back that's controlling a ship in the ocean. It seems like it's about a mile long. They can land aircraft on it. The rudder is controlling that, and our tongue is like that. It's very powerful. Even though it's small, it's powerful. And what James is telling us here, too, is if we don't control our tongue, our tongue is so powerful, it will control us. When we open our mouth to speak, we should speak only gracious words. We should speak kind words. We should speak loving words. Words of truth, thoughtful words. Holy words, sensitive words edifying words. We should speak gently. We should speak with comfort. We should speak with blessing. We should speak with humility and wisdom. We should speak words of thanksgiving. We should always speak unselfishly. It should not be about us. And we should speak words of peace. When we're able to do that, then we find that controlling the other aspects of our life gets easier it gets easier. Paul said, I mean, James says when you control the tongue, you control the whole body. Everything else starts to fall in place when you can control your mouth. Because you see, the mouth can only be controlled by the Holy Spirit, just indwelling living through us. The mouth can only, the tongue can only be tamed by the Holy Spirit by God. Oh. Controlling the tongue is more than just an evidence of our spiritual spiritual maturity is also evidence of our faith, of our true saving faith. If we're able to control the tongue, that's one of the evidences that we can see in our lives that tells us our faith is real and that we have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Psalms chapter 39 verse 1, David saying, I will guard my ways so that I may not sin with my tongue. 
He's saying, I realize that my tongue will lead me in trouble if I follow my tongue where my tongue would lead me. So I will guard my tongue so that I don't sin. And then he goes on to say, I will guard my mouth with a muzzle as long as the wicked are in my presence. Often we find ourselves in a conversation with other people who are speaking in an ungodly manner. And, and man, I'm not sure. I think sometimes we're more guilty of this than others. We, we fall under that peer pressure. We get around a bunch of men who are telling, uh, talking in ways they shouldn't. Using foul language or telling dirty jokes or doing whatever they do. And, and a lot of times I've seen men who normally wouldn't do that because they're around a group of men who are doing it. Just kind of fall into that conversation. If you don't believe me, just get around a bunch of coaches because they could be some dirty mouth people. And what David is telling us here is he understands that when he's in the presence of evil people who are using evil speech, he's going to put a muzzle on his mouth. He's just going to shut up. He's not going to say anything. If he says anything at all, I'm sure he's probably telling God we shouldn't be talking this way. But what David's saying is when I'm in the presence of evil people and there's evil conversation going on, I'm putting a muzzle on my mouth and I'm not going to get involved in that. I'm not going to fall into that trap of talking like other people talk just because I feel the pressure of being drawn into the group. The tongue is powerful. It can tear people down. It can tear churches down. It can devastate a family. It can wreck a marriage. It can rip a nation apart. It can lead to murder and it can also lead to wars. But that same tongue also has the power to build people up, to build churches up. It can create love, it can create enthusiasm, it can encourage people. With that same tongue we can speak comfort, we can speak peace, and we can bring about a multitude of joy through the same mouth that we have the opportunity to tear down with. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. James says, so too. Though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how large a forest a small fire ignites, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness. It's placed among the parts of the body. It pollutes the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is set on fire by hell. The tongue is a small member of our body. It's a small part of our body, but it is very powerful. It can change the course of direction for the whole body. But the tongue is also very, it's also very dangerous. The tongue is very dangerous. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard the reports of the, the fires that are going on out west. They're devastating. These forest fires are going on in places like California. Uh, was just a few days ago, I was hearing a news report where they said 30,000 acres of ground was burned in less than 12 hours. 30,000 acres in 12 hours. Tens of thousands of people are being evacuated. Thousands of people have lost their homes. A few have lost their lives. Some have lost everything they have. Fire can be devastating. And our tongue can be like that. James is telling us our tongue can be just like a fire. See, a lot of those fires that were started out west probably were started by something small. Maybe somebody driving down the road had a cigarette button and flipped it out the window and it started that way. There may have been some boy scout camping up in the mountain somewhere that had a spark that got out of his campfire. We don't know how some of them started, but we know that they probably started small and they grew. And our, our tongue works that same way. You see, a, just like a careless spark can start a forest fire, a few careless words can do a lot of damage. A few careless words can do a, a lot of damage. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20, 20, 21 says, Without wood, fire goes out. Without a gossip, conflict dies down. As charcoal for embers and wood for fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Gossips and rumors. These, these people, they go around spreading them. Or they're the spark. The question is, is, are we going to be the wood? They're the spark. Are we going to be the wood? Are we going to take hold of that spark and get that fire on us and then we're going to spread it to someone else or are we going to put it out? Fire is dangerous because it multiplies. Now, you know, those poor people down in Louisiana that's going through all this flood, I certainly feel for them. And I pray for them, and I know they're, they're devastated probably just as much or more than the people with the fire situation. 
but there's a difference between fire and water. If I take a cup of water and I pour it out on the floor, it will spread out. It'll look bigger, it'll spread out, but it's still just a cup of water. It doesn't get any bigger. I can take one match and I can start a fire and it can burn a whole forest down. It can burn a city down, it can burn a church down, burn a, burn a house down. So a little bit of fire can spread very quickly. So that's why James is comparing our tongue to fire because what we say can spread fast. Proverbs 16, verse 27 says, A worthless man digs up evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. There are people who go out and they just try to dig up stuff. They, they like to dig in the dirt. They like to find dirt on people, and then they like to tell it. And people who are like that, the Scripture tells us, are like a scorching fire. They're burning everybody that's around them. Everybody around them suffers because their voice is like a scorching flame. A careless tongue can burn a church to the ground. In verse 7 and 8, the word there says, Every sea creature, reptile, bird, or animal is tamed and has been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. James is telling us here that a tongue, our tongue is like a wild, savage, uncivilized, undisciplined, irrepressible, irresponsible animal. And just like any other wild animal that's caged, that's fighting against being controlled. Have you ever noticed that your tongue fights against your control? It doesn't have any desire to be controlled by you. It fights against you. It's easier to tame a wild animal than it is to tame our tongue. The tongue is like a wild monster that's been encaged and is trying to get out all of the time. Always trying to escape our mouth and say something we didn't really intend for it to say. Psalm Chapter 140, verse 3 says to make our tongues, they make their tongues as sharp as snake bites. Viper's venom is under their lips. I notice in verses 7 and 8 there, James says that the tongue cannot be tamed by man. He's saying we men, women, children, we cannot tame our tongues. We can't do it. It's impossible. It cannot be tamed by man. But he doesn't say it can't be tamed at all. You see, it can be tamed, but it can only be tamed by God. It can only be tamed by God. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that's indwelling us, that's leading us, that our tongue can be controlled. When we are true believers and the Spirit is working in us, the Spirit will guide us. And if we allow our tongue to follow where the Spirit is leading, then the tongue can be controlled. Now, we deny where the Spirit is leading our tongue and we go off on our own direction, we, we, we still get ourselves into trouble. In verses 9 and 10, verses 9 and 10, James says, We praise our Lord and Father with it, being the tongue, and we curse men who are made in God's likeness with it. Praising and cursing come out of the same mouth, my brothers, these things should not be this way. The greatest use of our tongue, the greatest purpose we can serve with our speech is to praise our God. Oh. That's the best we can do with our tongue. But we use that same tongue that we praise God with to curse those who are made in God's image. And when we do that, then we become hypocrites. We become hypocrites because we should not, as James is telling us, praise God and curse men out of the same mouth. He's saying these things should not be. Now we see examples of that all throughout Scripture. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of their time, praised God. They did. They praised God. They were, they were the ones of the Jewish nation who were uh, putting on a show maybe, but they were praising God. They were required to pray like eight times a day. It was a, a lot of prayer that they had to to pray and they praise God with their mouth but then those same Pharisees turned around and cursed Jesus <coughs> Peter Peter when Jesus asked him who do you say that I am Peter responded by saying thou art Christ thou art Christ thou art the son of the living God it was only a few days after Peter said that that 
Peter found himself standing outside the court that, uh, uh, that the, the Pharisees were having for Jesus. And when people would come to him and ask him about his association with Jesus, he would curse and say, I don't know the man. Cursing and praising out of the same mouth. James is telling us, my brethren, this should not be. Move on to verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12, uh, the word there says, Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? <clears throat> Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. James goes on to explain that a fresh water spring cannot produce salt. I mean, a, a salt water spring cannot produce fresh water. He's saying that uh, uh, grapes can't produce figs. He's saying that uh, uh, bitter and sweet water can't come out of the same spring. His conclusion of all of this is to tell us that an unclean heart cannot produce clean words and a clean heart cannot produce unclean words. He's telling us if we have a righteous heart, we're going to speak righteously. And if we have an unrighteous heart, we're going to speak unrighteous words. <coughs> the question this morning, I guess, is are we with our tongues producing fresh water that anyone can drink, or are we producing salt water from which no one can protect? Now I'll close this morning with this verse from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. There's a lot in Scripture about the tongue. Paul spoke of the tongue. Uh, James spoke of the tongue. And here Peter speaks of the tongue. And, and Peter tells us in these verses, he says, For the one who wants to love light and see good days. How many of us want to love light and see good days? I hope everybody in here wants to love light and see good days. He says, for the one who wants to love light and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And he must turn away from evil and do what is good. He must speak peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to the to, to their request. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. If you are truly transformed, if you are truly a new creature in Christ, if you're a new creation in Christ, if you're born again, if you have a newness of life that the scripture speaks of, then with that came a new tongue, a new mouth, new words. That's the evidence of your true salvation, one of them. One of the pieces of evidence we should be looking for in our life. If you're missing that, the altar's open to you this morning. We'll have the musicians come up. It's a great message for all of us. I'm preaching to myself this morning as much as I'm preaching to anybody, controlling the tongue. The altar's open for you for any purpose this morning, any reason. We're here to pray with you if you have needs. If you're struggling with tongue issues, then there's no better place to, than to pray for that than right here where we can pray with you. And, and, On page 285, let's stand.